Welcome to Destiny Alive in Relationship. And uh, my message today is that destiny in relationship hinges on the highest relationship. So, I don't know if you've noticed this, but Christianity and Judaism are unique among world religions in one point. The most important point, I believe, is that they emphasize relationship with the highest being that is God. In a lot of the other world religions, what you have is emphasis on something slightly different, although those emphases would be the preferred mechanism to get to God or to get to enlightenment or whatever it is that you want to get to. So, for example, uh, Gnosticism of the early church, uh, Freemasonry, Buddhism, atheism, emphasize relationship to knowledge or to the intellect. The more you know, the more significant you are, the higher you go, the more you're evolved. Um, as the Buddha said, all suffering is the result of ignorance. And he often said that uh, we need to uh, develop the intellect. This is the greatest good. Um, now, there are some religious systems, like in the New Age, that emphasize relationship with higher beings, like spirit guides or, or someone who's more evolved than yourself, to get you on the path to more knowledge, to this hidden knowledge, to the secret knowledge. But again, the emphasis is on the human relationship to knowledge. Um, then you have a, a different brand of religion, and you have Islam, Hinduism, and many other non-religious sort of groups that tend to emphasize relationship to goodness or to service. Um, so for example, the better you are, the better off you are. So uh, you can have, um, for example, someone who serves Allah, they give their, their lives in service to Allah in order to gain favor in his eyes and to be rewarded. Um, and in Hinduism, of course, we have karma, and so you do good works so that those good works come to you and you keep doing this to get higher and higher. So the idea is that um, you can have religious systems or systems of any sort that are emphasizing something that sounds good. It sounds good, it's knowledge, it's goodness, and perhaps it's even beauty. Um, you can have you know, groups of celebrities who say beauty is the highest good, you should you know, seek to have beauty, seek to have beauty. And you know, that's great, you know what, knowledge, Goodness, beauty, where do they all originate? They originate from the very nature of God. But there's something very important here that we have to think about. Is that God himself is the intersection and the foundation of all knowledge and all goodness and all beauty. That means that if we actually are seeking knowledge as the highest good without seeking the knowledge as the offspring of seeking God as the highest good, we might falter in the other areas. Maybe we will put aside goodness or put aside beauty for knowledge as our highest good, um, which is very interesting because uh, I went to uh, Cambodia a few years ago. My sister-in-law was there on a two-year missions trip. And uh, my husband and I, we stayed in the upstairs of this little, um, it was like an inn or like a, a little cafe. And, uh, and right upstairs, you go up the stairs, it's all open to outdoors. And uh, right at the top of the stairs, there's a big, beautiful Buddha statue there to, to greet us. <laughs> and uh, we're like, wow, this is very interesting. Um, and everywhere you go throughout the city, there are, are little shrines and little statues, and, and it's very much a, a Buddhist area, not not very high percentage of Christian at all. And uh, one thing I noticed is that in our interactions with the people, um, power, intellect, influence were all very highly respected. And if you were poor, you were considered to be lower in significance. And uh, they, uh, they told some stories because there were um, some people there that we were there in a, in a ministry, we were ministering to them. And uh, a lot of them come from very abusive backgrounds. And uh, 
my sister-in-law told them a story. She said that, you know, when she was younger, the, um, you know, her dad had said something and it hurt her feelings. And so her dad came and, and said, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? And the Cambodian there who was hearing the story, he said, what do you mean? How could your father come to you and ask for forgiveness? He's the one who has a higher honor. Like, he would never do that. Like, it, we've never experienced this. Like, someone who has higher honor has no obligation to talk to someone, you know, who's younger than themselves and, and say, I'm sorry. <laughs> and so, um, it's, it's just very interesting. It's, it's just a different culture because there's a different value system in the background. Um, so, the interesting thing that results from these different emphases in these different world religions is that in Christianity, the thing that we seek as our highest good, the thing that Jesus tells us to seek, is God and his righteousness, his kingdom. And what happens when you seek God, his kingdom, his righteousness, is that all the other things are added to you as blessings. And so... We know that when Jesus said that he was going to go be with his father, what did he promise? He said, I promise that I will send you the comforter. And the comforter, the spirit, will guide you into all truth. So here we go. If we follow God, we'll be led into the truth. And we know that if we follow God, some of the fruits of the spirit are love and joy and peace. And, and all of these things, all of these things are the things that people are looking for in any religious system. They're looking for something that's going to give them, this is, this is our highest virtue, this is the highest thing that we can aim for in the universe. And they believe that if they seek after this, this is going to make them fulfilled and significant and secure. But we know, as people who follow after God, that God is the source of all of those things. So the only way we can truly have security is not in attaining power for ourselves. It's not in attaining the most beauty. It's not in attaining the most knowledge. It's in having a relationship with the source of all of those things, which is God. So, there are some people who, upon looking at Christians and seeing how they act, and perhaps reading some stories in the Bible and having conversations with people get this impression of the God of the Bible. And they say, well, look at the God of the Christians and of the Jews. This is how he really is. He says, I'll bless you if you follow me. And if you don't follow me, I'm going to curse you. So they say, oh, the God of the Christians you say he's the source of all knowledge and all goodness and all beauty and all of these things are so good, but he actually is just this manipulative God. He's actually kind of weak. He doesn't really know much. He's, you know, just one of the other false gods that there are all throughout the mythologies of all the human beings that have ever lived on the earth. He's just, you know, another one of those. So, what do we say to this? Here's an idea. Perhaps when God is talking to his people Israel and giving them the promise of blessings if they follow him and also the corresponding promise of curses if they don't follow him, what if this is because God in his goodness is giving them a warning? Hey, look, if you go that direction, this is what actually happens as a natural consequence, right? So what happens when um, we are parents and we see our little kids coming close to some fire? We say, don't go to the fire, that will hurt. And it's not because we're trying to manipulate them and get them to stay close to us because we just you know, want to keep a tight rein on them, and we don't want to give them freedom, we don't care about them, their independence. It's like, no, we are keeping them away from the pain and the suffering that will result from their actions. And so in the same way, God knows he is 
the source of all good things. He is the source of all life. And so if there are people who, in their minds, reason, mm, I think I want to go after this thing, this, oh, this knowledge. Yes, that's right, this knowledge. And I think that God doesn't really have all this knowledge. I think I can find it somewhere else. And God knows that this is reasoning that's going to lead them astray. It's going to lead them into falsehood. It's going to lead them into brokenness and destruction. And he says, please, don't do this. This is going to lead you to all of this mess and all of this chaos and all these curses. So please, please, just, just don't go there. Just stay here. Stay here. I want to protect you. I want to, I want to make sure that you're okay. So in the end, what I would say, as I am thinking about this, I'm thinking, it's actually because God respects human freedom that he would actually give us those warnings about what's happening. He would rather just be up front and say, look, okay guys, I'm not going to force you to do this, but I'm going to just, you know, be up front and tell you, here's what's going to happen. If you do this, you'll have life, you'll be blessed, You'll have abundance. If you do this, well, you're going to fall apart. And uh, so, thinking back all the way to the beginning of the story, we see that God created all of the universe, the earth, everything, all of creation. And he says, after each bit of creation that he puts forth, he says, it is good. And what did he do at the end of creation? He created man, Adam, human beings, male and female, in his image. And he gave human beings dominion over the earth. And he said, I'm going to let you guys free. I'm going to let you guys, you know, work it out. And I want you, you know, ideally to shadow me, to be in my image, to copy how I am, because from me emanates goodness. I want you to be trained up to, to learn how to steward the power that comes with freedom to do good or bad, or to do whatever it is in the universe, everything. You have this power, and I want to give it to you so that you can learn to wield it for good. And so, what did God do in the garden? He gave Adam and Eve lots of good choices. But he also gave them a choice to gain what? To gain the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I would argue that if there were people that were honestly, sincerely looking for knowledge, true knowledge, that they would eventually be led back to God because God is the source of all knowledge. So, when we have the atheist or the scientist in our um, media coming on, you know, airing on CNN, saying, well, all I want to know is the truth. And all these religious people, they don't care about the truth. I care about the truth, and I won't stop until I find the truth. You know what? I would say... Let's bless them. Say, yes, find the truth. Because the truth will lead you back to God. This is just a season. If you're really looking for truth, you will find the truth. Because whoever knocks, to, to whoever knocks, the door will be opened. Whoever seeks will find. So, I would say that, you know, it's, it's interesting. I had a friend, and a, a Christian friend, and she asked me one day, she said, you know, I have uh, some, you know, mother and father-in-law from Hong Kong, and uh, they are open to the idea, you know, there's a highest good. There's a highest good, and they want to see, to serve the highest good, but they don't, they can't really accept the idea that there is a God. You know, and I told her, you know, maybe you don't have to be so worried for them. Don't be worried. Just pray. Just pray that in their 
pursuit to seek after the highest good, that that highest good would eventually open their eyes to the originator of the highest good. So, it's interesting because we can seek after goodness, we can seek after beauty, we can seek after knowledge, we can seek after all of these things, but those in and of themselves as ends aren't the complete picture. All of those things are actually just like little trails that are out here, little, little threads for us to follow, and they all lead us back to the source. And when we are living our lives, we have choices to make. We can choose to seek after what is good, or we can choose to seek after something that's not so good. Oh, that's not so good. Oh, but it's interesting. <laughs> Or, oh, maybe this isn't quite true, but, oh, it sure is interesting. And this is the very choice that Adam and Eve had in the garden. The serpent came and said, well, don't you want to be like God and know about good and evil? And I really think that God, it wasn't so much about the fact that he wouldn't want us to eventually one day know about good and evil. I think he just knew that if we would seek to know the good, that would be much less painful for us in our development. Maybe one day he would say, hey, you guys have developed enough strength of character. I'll show you what I see. But instead we thought, God's holding back. I think I can find out Something that he isn't going to tell me by going out on my own and exploring and seeking these other sources of information. And this is something that is very, very alluring about many um, false religions, especially a lot of these cults, is the idea that there's secret knowledge that only the special few only the very significant ones, only the very gifted ones, have access to. And, uh, you know, in, in Buddhism it's, it's very interesting because uh, there is a part where um, the, the Buddha actually admits that, well, only men could actually be enlightened, women are actually corrupt, and so if they actually want to be on the path toward enlightenment, they will have to, you know, aim to be good in this life so that they can be reborn as a man oh, so that eventually, <laughs> so eventually they will gain enlightenment. So, um, so the, the picture is very much um, different from the picture that we get from the Christian God. And, you know, it's very interesting because God, although he knows all of the possible outcomes of all of these circumstances. He understands what happens if he gives people dominion over the earth. He says, okay, I'm going to give you guys power. Power to do stuff on the earth. And that will actually have real consequences and real effects within your dominion. And, uh, and so he, even though he knows this, he knows the potential, he... Uh, he says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, you know, in a sense, hands off because this is your domain. I'm not going to come in and fix every little problem. Um, and, of course, he's very interested and very involved. He's very active in that way. But um, as it was pointed out um, by our previous speakers, God is a gentleman. He doesn't ever impose. He doesn't force you. He doesn't actually just say, this is the way it is. And it has to be this way. He actually gives us choices. And he lets us have our experiences the way that we desire. And so it says in Genesis 6 6 that there came a point in the history of the earth that mankind became so evil and corrupt, and there was just wickedness everywhere on the earth, that the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. And his heart was deeply troubled. Now, I think it might take a lot to make the God of the universe deeply troubled. 
So that must have been some pretty wicked stuff going on. And I think it's very interesting that in the text, it says the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, which makes it seem like, huh, well, maybe God had a choice in his mind. He thought, you know, maybe I could just make human beings in heaven here with me. I wouldn't give them dominion. I wouldn't give them choice. They would just be perfect. And we could all live here in harmony. And they would just be my servants. But what if I give them dominion? And I take a risk. And I put them onto the earth. And I say, you know what? You can choose to follow me, follow my example, live in the image that you were created to live in, or you can choose to go another direction if you want to. I think that takes a lot of heart. <laughs> takes a lot of boldness, a lot of courage. But I really think that this has to do with the destiny of human beings. Because if God had created human beings in heaven, there would be certain things that human beings would never learn. We would never learn how to wield the power of free choice. We would never learn how to overcome evil and difficulty and suffering. We would never learn how to overcome heartbreak. We would never learn how to take dominion over the storms as Jesus did on the boat. I think it's very interesting that in the scriptures it's also said Paul says in 1 Corinthians in his letter to the Corinthians he says if any of you has a dispute with another do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world and if you are to judge the world are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? So Paul gives us a little picture, I think, into a bit of the destiny that God has in mind for the human race. It's not just, let's just figure out how to, you know, get our lives in, in shape. Because God actually gave us a creation at the start that was good. And he made humans good at the start. So it all started there. The point of life was to just make ourselves better. Then it seems like God would have maybe started us off with, you know, maybe chaos and, you know, confusion. And, and you know, maybe we just didn't have an intellect. And maybe we had to, you know, grow and evolve in all of these different facets until we finally grew to the knowledge and the goodness that God had in mind for us one day. But that's not really the story that we get when we read the scripture. Instead, instead, God created human beings in his image from the start, and there's nothing that we can do to actually increase are standing before God because we're already as significant as we can be because God is the most significant being and we're made in his image. So we don't get more significant if we have more intellect or more power or more beauty or more abundance or more goodness. We don't grow in our significance. Instead, we have the opportunity to accept the grace of God in our imperfections and say, God, we have made some mistakes, yes, but we want to be in your image and we want to do the things that you've put into our hearts and we want to reach our destiny. And God, we want to partner with you. We want to know you first and foremost because you are the highest good. You are in the highest place. And we know that if we get connected to you, that's when we'll have connection to true knowledge and to true kindness and compassion and love and goodness and beauty and abundance. 
because God is the source. So there's no need to search for the secret knowledge or for the goodness of saints and monks and, you know, the Dalai Lama. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to seek to develop ourselves and to evolve and to promote our human powers and to, and to do these things to pull ourselves up. Because what happened is God actually came down to us and he says, I am seeking you in heavenly places with Christ. It is God who is our source of our highest destiny. And he is the one that has given us the highest calling and the highest significance from the moment that he even had the thought of creating us. And there's nothing else that we can do to add to that. So today, I just want to say, if you've ever had the feeling that you need to be smarter, to be wiser, to have more power, to be better, uh, to have more accomplishments, to have more abundance in order to prove yourself and to be more significant, then I would suggest, I think you haven't found your highest source of significance. You haven't gotten attached to the highest source of your destiny, the best purposes for your life. There's something better in store for you. There's something that it requires actually not more striving to be better, but it actually requires the rest and the trust to say, I know that I belong to God and I know that he is my source. And I know that he will use me in the way that he sees best. Because God actually didn't design us just for a purpose. He designed us because he likes us. And he wants to have a relationship with us. And he says, I think you're cool. I like you. I like your ideas. I like to see you create. I want you to be like me. I want you to be a creator like me. And the focus is very outward. God wants relationship with us. It's an outward thing. He wants, he wants to train us up how to have dominion. It's an outward thing. We're, we're bringing the inward atmosphere and the nature of God outward into the reality around us. We're making it manifest around us. And this is the outward focus of Christianity that springs from the outward focus of a creator God. It's not an internal focus of, I need to become more significant and enlightened and empowered and evolved and I need to reach higher and higher and, and, and go up the stratosphere into the heavens. It's just not that picture. You already are seated in the heavenly places. You already are there. And if you know that, you won't fall into the deceptions that are everywhere. Everywhere. I was looking at real estate in Hollywood Hills. And about 50% of the houses have big statues of Buddha and big statues of whatever idol and whatever, you know, big um, things from meditation. And I say, God, there's so much deception and it's so sad because these people are made in your image and they're so significant. They're so significant, but they don't know it. Their significance has been stolen from them and they get manipulated into these places where they feel like they have to do this, otherwise they'll lose their power, they'll lose their fame, they'll lose their beauty, they'll lose their, their place of status, and then they'll lose their significance and all will be lost. And this is the deception of the enemy. This is not God's reality. And I think that this is something that's, that's really a hard thing to overcome. I, I feel like this has been a struggle for me for many years, actually. Uh, I guess it can be kind of embarrassing how many times God has to hit you across the head to get the same point across. But for so many years, I was so caught up in what am I doing? Am I significant? Did I succeed? Am I failing? Am I losing my significance? How am I doing compared to everybody else? Am I significant enough? Am I doing enough? Am I worthy? And the Lord says, look, 
What if I gave you every single talent that you ever had just so that you could be a mother to your children? And that's it. It's like nothing, nothing else. That's, that's it. Just so that you can pour into your children so that they can succeed. What, what then? What would you think? And I said, oh God, that's a hard question. <laughs> that's a hard question. And it's very interesting. What if, what if God didn't give you that talent, that intellect, that virtue, that upbringing, that wealth, that business, that success? What if you didn't have that? Would you feel less worthy? Would you feel like you were less of a person? Would you feel less significant? I think that this is one reason that God calls us to reach out to the poor and the needy, to those who are considered insignificant by the world, because he wants to always keep us in touch with the reality, the deeper reality, that every person is significant in his eyes, and that actually we're no more significant than they are. And it's actually by the grace of God that we can be risen up and exalted, just as Christ had to humble himself in order to be exalted to the highest place. So too, we have to be a servant to all men in order to be great in the kingdom of heaven. And so I challenge you, if there is something in your life that has gotten in the way, then in your life, if you're seeking after significance for, for anything, anything, in the world, anything, intellect, riches, status, your neighborhood, your car, how well your kids are doing, anything, anything that is in your mind, that thing that will make you feel like now you've got it all together, and now you're significant, and now you're secure, and now you're okay. Is there anything in your life that has taken that place that isn't the Lord? That isn't Jesus, the one who came to die for you. The one who thought that you were so valuable, even while you were imperfect and broken, insignificant, and a sinner. So God, we just give to you all of those things in life. All of those things that we have struggled with struggled to give over to you those things that we feel like are so integral into our identity those things that make us feel special those things that make us feel superior to someone else God we give those things to you and as a church God we ask for your grace and for your forgiveness when we look at those who are outside the church and we say we are more significant than you evildoers we are more significant than you, and we hate you for what you do, and you have to conform and follow us. Oh, God, we say we are so sorry. We are so sorry. Please forgive us, God, and please give us your grace, because it's only by your grace that your kingdom can flow through us into the world. And it's only by your love that the enemy can be toppled from his places of influence. And God, we need you. We need you. In all of these places where people are confused and chasing for significance or these things that will make them feel at rest, these things are things that are passing away, things that, that are only achieved through much striving and through fear. We have to prove ourselves, and oh, it's so painful, because who is the perfect one who can prove himself perfect before an all-perfect God? Not one of us has achieved that level of perfection in God. We need your grace. We need your grace. Please, we ask you to come. 
and heal our hearts from those places where we have been hurt, those places where we have been wounded, the places where we've attached our significance to something and our hopes and dreams have been shattered. God, please restore those places of our heart and reorient our focus, renew our minds, God, so that we have you as our highest place, our highest love, and our highest focus, so that we can come into our highest destiny, both as individuals and as a community of people who follow after God, who are advancing your kingdom, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.